with Billy Corgan of Smashing Pumpkins. Here is PJ on the toll free in Tinley Park, Illinois. Hi, PJ, and welcome to CBS Late Night. Hello. Good evening, Tom. How are you? I'm fine, PJ. Hope you are, too. Um, first of all, I wanted to let you know that it's really an honor to talk with you. You're, Thank you. You are a class act. And Thank you. you will be sorely missed next year. I appreciate that, PJ. Uh, besides hearing about Oliver, I really like hearing about your mom also. By the way, I saw her Sunday. She's doing fine. I appreciate that. Thank My dad uh, was a big fan of hers. He passed away about two or three months ago. Um, hello, Billy. Good evening. Um, I, I'm a big fan and also an XRT listener, saw uh, you guys recently at Metro and also at The World. And my question for you is, what are your feelings toward entertainers getting into politics, local, state, or national, of course, most recently with uh, the Minnesota now governor-elect? Right. Well, uh, I think the, I think uh, Jesse the body, Ventura. Jesse the mind now, as he Jesse calls Jesse the mind. <laughs> I think uh, him... Winning the election is a great thing because I think um, at least it shows some sort of want and desire for truth in politics. Um, I think there's a real need for that in America. As far as entertainers get into politics, I think entertainers probably are too conscious of the contradictions of, of public life. And, and I, I, I can't see how entertainers would make very good politicians. Because they, they, entertainers have to, un, they know too well the compromises that go on at, at, at the upper levels of things. And I, I know that government is no different. So I, I don't think entertainers could go into politics with the same idealism. It's, it's interesting uh, that you identify uh, Jesse Ventura as not an athlete, PJ, but an entertainer. Well, um, I've, always, uh, I've always felt that he has the athletic qualities, as do most of the uh, wrestling uh, um, sector, but it's more entertainment just like anything True. else. True. PJ, thank you for your compliment, and thanks for watching our show tonight. Thanks a lot for taking my call. Okay, sir. Have a good, good weekend. All right, bye-bye now. Let me ask you here, and this, this is not a happy topic, but, you know, rock music has lost some great stars, uh, mm. Kurt Cobain and others. Mm. And uh, for those of you who work in the business, in that part of the business, what, what, what effect does the deaths of, uh, of Mr. Cobain and others have on the industry, do you think? Mm -hmm. Uh, phew, that's a tough question. I mean, certainly from a completely selfish artistic level, I think it's sad when any great artist dies, certainly prematurely, um, because it, that is in essence the voice and identity of your generation. You know, I mean, it's the collective group that, that forms the voice. So when, when one of those people who are leaders of your generation aren't there, it makes it harder to communicate right, to everybody. Right, and diminishes the strength of that generation. I think the, other, the thing that strikes me deeper, though, is, is the effect that it has on subsequent generations who glamorize and make something like that into a myth, you know, because, you know, as you've seen with past stars, Jim Morrison and other, Jimi Hendrix, you know, the, the, the live fast, die young becomes glorified and really sends the wrong message because life is live fast, live long, mm -hmm. you know, not die young. And, and that's the hardest part to watch because I don't think anybody who would die prematurely, would want to leave that legacy. You seem to have walked the straight and narrow path. We, we've, we've not heard your name connected with, with, with foolishness or substance abuse. I go out at night. <laughs> 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 how, how, how did you develop the, 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 the discipline, if that's the correct word, mm -hmm. to lead the life that you do? Um, well, certainly I think uh, my family situation played into that. I come from you know, a family that had problems with substance abuse and, uh, you know, different kinds of abuse. So I'm, I'm overly sensitive to those topics. I think I probably paid a lot more attention to them and was a little more wary because you know, I, in essence, was living the kind of the negative result of being a child in those kind of environments. So, I don't know. I and, mean, I just don't have the constitution for it, whatever. And, and when you say that, that, that you're, you, you were a product of your childhood mm -hmm. and that there were some negatives there, Mm -hmm. What, your, your parents split up? And there was... Well, there's divorces and there were substance abuses and mental illnesses and, you know, your typical American family. <laughs> right, typical American functional, dysfunctional family. Right, Yeah, right. the life we right. all lead. And... Right. I'm just saying I think as an adult it makes me more sensitive to those topics and probably not... That's what I'm saying. I think a lot of my peers get caught up in the myth of rock and roll, get caught up in the myth of drug abuse and that you have to kind of in essence live on the edge to be a great artist which I think is is not true you know, that's my that's my own personal belief you know my generation had had heroes you know lots of heroes mm -hmm. um, 
does your you, does your generation, the so-called Generation X, have any heroes? Um, yes, we do, but unfortunately, I think the media won't let anybody be a hero. You know, I think if you I think if you really look hard at anyone, you're going to find faults. You know, we can look at the good side of Clinton, or we can look at the bad side of Clinton, and and, and they're both equally as compelling. But you know, you know. Humphrey Bogart had faults, mm -hmm. you know, John Wayne had faults, but these people are still American heroes because of their kind of incandescent talent and their ability to translate certain emotions. And we, we too often confuse, you know, the message with the messenger. You know, people are kind of divinely chosen to be translators of greater powers and energies. And I think in this current culture, we try to kind of dismantle those figures in an effort to almost empower ourselves. I mean, I find myself doing it. We kind of want to tear people down mm -hmm. to, to equate ourselves with them instead of just letting people be great. You know, a great baseball pitcher can't just be great. There has to be some sort of hidden drama. A rock star just can't be a great rock star. There must be something wrong. And it's, it's always scratching at the pain, and I think it's a sad case. It's kind of this, you know, the Springer culture, you know, where we just want to kind of rip everything down all the time. And, and when you say that the media denies the status of hero, mm -hmm. To certain members of Generation X, who are those that we are talking about? You mean media or no, 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 the heroes. Mm -hmm. I mean, what what people would they be? I mean, yeah, whew, that's a toughie. I mean, in my world, it's rock stars, you okay. know, because because at least in our generation, you know, they're the voice. They're the people who are you know willing to stand up and say something. But the, I, I've met so many people I would call heroes that. You know, people work in these battered women shelters, and those are real heroes, you know. But it's that kind of weird disparity where the people who are the voices aren't allowed to transmute the energy of the people who are, who are the real heroes, so nobody wins. I don't know if that makes any sense. It's like the people who are kind of need to be the, the beams by which the energy pass through can't be heroes, so they can't even relay a good message because they're dismantled, so the people who really are heroes can't even aspire to be something because why would they want to be aspire to be that? It's just a constant dismantling of everything. It's the, just our well, culture. The thing you mentioned, yes, our culture does that. We tend to take all the things that that, that are admirable mm -hmm. in people and set them aside and try and try and find something that is not admirable. And as you say, claw at the pain, claw at yeah. the, the dark side, claw yeah. at the negative. Yeah. Let me pause here for our sponsors. We're chatting with Billy Corgan. Uh, the Smashing Pumpkins is his group. The new uh, CD is called Adore, and we'll be right back after these messages. Back with Billy Corgan of Smashing Pumpkins. In the break, we were chatting about the fact that Billy this summer sang Take Me Out to the Ball Game for the stretch at, at Wrigley Field in the seventh right. inning. And you said it was a terrifying experience? Well, because you're kind of waiting to go you know they got you up there ready to sing and but you don't know when they're gonna make the last out that's right there's no so clock, you think yeah. it's gonna go and then the guy you know hits a foul ball and and suddenly it's the last out and everyone starts going and they just kind of shove you out there and you know suddenly you're meeting Steve Stone and <laughs> and you're singing so but it was cool I, you know, I mean my parents and stuff couldn't have been prouder it's like one of those you know you know, my, like when you're in people, you know, yeah. your grandmother, your grandmother understands. <laughs> now people. you've made it. Yeah, in people. Right. Yeah. My son can sing. He sang the ball game song. Right. Yeah. And exactly. you mentioned there were some debacles this summer when other guest stars came yeah, out. Yes, so I've seen some people, uh, they couldn't remember the words. You're kidding. Yeah. Uh, Mike Ditka had the, the most famous one. He did his very quickly and, and out of breath. And, um, you know, our local weatherman about had an aneurysm. And who was the one the high who, notes. You, yeah, you, you, said, you, you told of one who started in the wrong key. How did it go? Well, the, the, the weatherman from Chicago, Tom Skilling, sorry, Tom, <laughs> he started really high. So when he got to so, the... So we'll do it like you did in the break. Take me out to the... And he just, you know, <laughs> the veins were popping. <laughs> and he had on the big glasses. And I, you know, I won't say the rest, but... but uh, <laughs> So you grew up in Chicago. I read this afternoon that you did, you're, you're, you're one musician who did not start a band in high school, mm -hmm. but you did write of music for the high school newspaper. Were you a critic for the paper? Yes. See, I cursed myself, you know, by being a critic to always be And who did you critique? Which bands? All of them? Um, well, uh, no, I would write things like I, would, I was very interested in new music, so I would try to turn people in the school onto new music. 
1984, I was writing about bands like R.E.M. and U2, which, of course, nobody had really heard of at that time. Things like that. No, you, you predicted pretty well, or you chose did, right. you know, fairly well. And when you were a young kid, uh, or a young man, really, in mm -hmm. high school, uh, uh, who, who would you sneak in to see if, if you did? You know, all kids sneak in to see ball games or concerts or right. stuff like that. I wasn't one of those kids. <laughs> oh, you... <laughs> I'm living out my rock and roll rebe rebellion now. Okay. <laughs> so what concerts did you pay your way into? Uh, well, I saw The Police, 1984, you know. And I, I met Sting, actually, about a week ago, you know. And I had that feeling, like, did you see me in the second row in 1984? <laughs> so. When you're, uh, when you're on stage, mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes the crowd can become a little unruly. Yes. Or shall I say, a little overexcited or enthusiastic? Yes. How about security at concerts? How do you how do you how do you maintain that? <sighs> That's a toughie. Um, see, if, if for the the alternative rock movement that we were involved with in the early '90s, we came from clubs where you know you just had people, and you know they had mosh pits. But most of the clubs you were playing was 500 people. Then you moved to a thousand. Then it got to be 3,000. But these are all fairly manageable situations. Well, when we reached the point where we were playing arenas, which is 18 to 20,000 people. Right. We wanted the same situation, so all the bands of my generation insisted and, and basically got rid of seats and arenas. But suddenly you have 10,000 people on the floor, and so it got very dangerous. So now when we play big shows like that, we've gone back to playing with seats. But it was a, it was a maturation process for everyone because it had never been done before. Right, so you'll learn by doing. You experiment as yeah, you go. Absolutely. I truly appreciate you doing this uh, program. Thank tonight. you. I know I you'd rather it. play than talk, but uh, it was really interesting to hear your, your, your thoughts on music and especially your stories about Wrigley Field, and I thank you for joining thank us, you, and I wish you continued success. Thanks. Okay, young man. Billy Corgan is the guest. Smashing Pumpkins, as you know, is the band, and the new CD is called Adore. We'll continue with former colleague Bob Berkowitz after these messages.